R5. So, did, so that was life. They, you know, they go do, go do your thing, I go do my thing. And in the summertime, and I spent my nights picking night walkers, my days picking red worms, bass bugging. If there's a little bug that lives in a the lake there, it's a dragonfly nymph. We call them bass bugs. You go around with this net on a wire hoop and you'd shove it into the bank, into the muck and stuff, bring it up, and then eat these little bugs would be crawling. You pick them up and you put them in a can. You got like five bucks for a hundred of them. Red worms were, uh, red worms are eight dollars a thousand. Night walkers were twelve dollars a thousand. So I was making twenty dollars a day, which at that time was good money. This is like 1977. That was pretty good money. So, especially for, you know, 13 year old. So that was enough to buy me a pack of cigarettes and I drank STST like it was my, my religion. That would buy me a pack of cigarettes and a can of tea a week. The rest of it they took and you know, blew it in a bar drinking and gambling on it, the pinball machine. Later on in life, mom got a bingo habit. And she spent thousands of dollars a month in the bingos. So that was that. And then, you know, I got to be um, 14 or so. And I went to ninth grade. And one day I was sitting there and I got in an argument with the, the science teacher. He had a Every morning, you know, my body was regulated, and every morning I, quarter after nine, first period of class, I'd have to pee. You know, hey, Mr. Ricker, can I take a, yeah. So he got mad one day, and he said me, no, you're not going to the bathroom. Every day you cut my class, you go to the, I said, don't listen, either you leave me go to the bathroom, or I'm going to piss in the corner. Go ahead, I'd love you to see it. Well, okay, so I pissed in the corner which proceeded into a, an, an outraged teacher running down the aisle, which who promptly got knocked out. So that was the first week of ninth grade. <laughs> Second week of ninth grade, I'm sitting in a homeroom class, and I, I, the homeroom teacher was a decent guy. And uh, I, he said to me, um, I got a note here from the office. You need to go down and talk to uh, Joe. So, okay. I got down the office. And said, what do you want? Literally, and it's just like that. I hated the guy. I wanted to kill him. We were, we were at odds for three years, and uh, so you know, he said to me, "If you can get a job by tomorrow, he says you will no longer be in school." He says, "I we we don't want you here." Sounds good to me. So I come home and I called a friend of mine. He had a concrete job, uh, business. And I said, hey, Sam. Said, yeah, well, yeah, I guess you can, Tom. Well, I need proof. Okay, stop by the house. Stop by the house. Picked up the paper. Took it to school the next day. And uh, walked in the office. It was like 20 after 8 in the morning. Here, Joe. Here's my working paper. Goodbye. It's at the end of the day, you're done. No, well, I'm done now. And went down and got my stuff out of my locker, what I owned, and walked out the front door and never looked back. Well, for now, I didn't look back. So then I went home. I worked for Sam for three weeks. He was he wasn't the guy I knew on the outside. As a boss, he was a dip. And uh he fired me one day because he kept yelling at me to pour this concrete and pour it, you know, and it's like, Sam, I put it, you know, you didn't do it. How can you not do it right? It comes down to shoot, you throw it in the hole. And well, yeah, I guess I didn't do it to his perfection or something. I don't know. So that was that. Done with that job. So now I'm not in school. And I don't have a job. Home life was bad. 
dad was beating mom, mom was beating dad, and everything that we made as far as money that we could have lived, we could have lived a good life, by the way. I went to the bars and the bingos and, the, you know, pinball machines and stuff, and I got tired of it. So, I packed my stuff up, which wasn't much. I had a, uh, what did I have at the time? I had a 22, I know that. I think it was a Winchester 250. It was a lever action, uh, hammerless lever action. I, it, it was a nice gun, but I can't explain it. And I had my shotgun. And through the summertime of the following year, and I used to hold back. My 22s were, I think, a dollar a box or $1.50 a box. So I wound up, I had a ton of them. Every time I get a chance to, I get over to Moscow on the way home from school. I buy a box of bullets. and So I had a ton of them. And I had probably four or five boxes of uh, 12 gigs. And that following summer, I, I was um, working for a guy by the name of Joe Kanopka cleaning up his yard. He was in the Navy in World War II, and he gave me his Navy helmet. And we were talking about knives and stuff one day, hunting. I said, no, you know, I have this pocket knife, that's it. He's like, no, you need a real knife. And he went in the house, and he brought out this uh, Mark II Navy K-Bar. I'll never forget it. Boy, I was rich. And... Uh, So I had that, and I had a canteen that went on a belt. In my, my 22, and I had, you know, a pair of good clothes and whatnot. And I said, all right, I'm done. And I went over in the woods on the family property, and I, I made a, I dug down about four foot into the ground and laid the canvas army tent that I had over top of it and literally made it a dugout. And that's that was my home. I hunted, I fished, and... I was gone for three days, and Dad came looking for me, and he found me, and I told him, I said, I'm not coming home, this is where I'm staying. So, it got to be really rainy one night, and I realized you can't live in a dugout. Then I realized I can't live there either, because they drove me nuts there too. I was still picking red worms and night walkers. But, you know, he knew where I was, and he'd come over and, well, we need to want, we need what, you know, he'd take my stuff. So I realized I couldn't stay there. So I left there, and I went to the mountain. And that's a, that was a whole other lifestyle. I lived in a, a double lean-to, or a wiki-up, I guess they call them now. Excuse me, for about three months. Trying to figure out how I'm going to do this. And you know, I was picking night walkers or red worms. And there was a local store there, Smoking Joe's. I used to buy batteries for the flashlight to pick the worms. And different various things like my cigarettes, my iced tea and stuff. So I was camped along the creek and I had no problems. I was doing just fine. Never came looking for me. And uh, so through the course of that summer, I got I knew all the neighbors, and I, I I put up carrots, I put up some potatoes, bought some flour from the store, you know, stocked up on what I needed to do for the winter. I was I wasn't stupid. I you, know, you need to have this stuff for the winter because you're not going to get it. it bullets and and you know bought a good pair of boots and. Uh, a field jacket. I had an army field jacket with the liner. That was my winter coat. And didn't look back, really. So that winter, I mean, winters was hard. You had to chop wood. You, you had to keep a fire going constantly for heat and stuff. But just before the winter of that year, I was walking through the woods and I, I found this old campsite. And I knew it was old because there was nothing touched, you know, for months, there was mold growing on some of the sleeping bags and stuff. I said, well, on this campsite, there was a, a canvas. It was a 7 by 7 tent, I think it was. 
No, it was bigger than that. It was maybe 10 by 10, and it sleeps seven people. One of them big canvas aluminum outside frame things. So it was that. There was a couple of sleeping bags in there. And um, hanging on a tree by the, this tent was a, a complete pot set. Nobody's touched it in ages, so little bit by little bit, I moved it over to where I lived, and wow, now I had a tent, and something to cook in, and all the happy stuff, because before it was just, you know, roasting it over the fire, so now I can make soups, and soups would last days, you know, and, um, so what I, I wound up doing is I cut the bottom out of the tent, and I, I dug a hole underneath it so I had a storage area under the tent to put the carrots and potatoes and stuff that I saved up, which was stupid with the bigger my area. Now I know that, but then I didn't. I had a pretty much the range. I had a nice uh, bed made out of uh, twigs. It was kind of bouncy, so it had some softness to it. And couple of sleeping bags I took. I used one for basically a mattress. I stuffed it with leaves and whatnot. And uh, I slept with the other two. I had one of my own and the other one that I found. So I was styling at this point. I had my guns there and I had food kind of stocked up. Not nearly enough, but you know, you didn't know it. I didn't know at the time. And uh, I had good warm sleeping equipment. I wound up building a, a rock fire pit up against the stone wall that was there. So I got to thinking, I was like, well, how can I heat the tent? Because, you know, it's going to get cold. So I moved that whole arrangement down by the fire. So I used to get a kind of a reflection and it didn't really warm the tent. So I got thinking about it and I heard about this. Uh, my brother was telling me about the Indians used to build up a mound of dirt inside their teepees and hollow out the inside of the, the dirt mound. And you could put a fire in there. You didn't have to worry about a spreading. And that's, you know, how true it is, I don't know. But it was like, hmm. Tent's not big enough for a fire. But you know, coals, coals are absolutely hot. So I built a mound in the corner of the tent about, no, well, maybe that big around. I hollowed out the middle and made a shelf. And what I used to do is I take the, the coals from the fire just before I went to bed, and put them in this hole and fill it up with coals, and then I'd put a thin layer of dirt over top so that they didn't burn so fast. And it, it kept that tent about 40, 45 degrees. That was nice. I was, I was, now I'm styling, you know. So I, I made it through that winter. And the following summer, I was doing the same thing with, the, you know, the worms and everything and building up my stores. I realized then what I had a store up. I made myself a little underground. I didn't know what a root cellar was because I grew up on a farm. I made myself a small little, like, four-by-four four root cellar. I was putting stuff in there. And in the meantime, you can't hunt in one area constantly. You'll blow it, you'll, you'll just ruin the game and nothing will come in there. So I used to hunt around my tent area. Then I started branching out. And then I realized, well, you know, I'm carrying a lot of stuff because sometimes I'd walk 10 miles, you know, up on a mountain and stuff. It's like I'm carrying a lot of stuff. So. It's like, well, what if I made a camp here and a camp here and a camp? That's an idea. So every four miles, I had a little trapper's cabin. It was just a little, like, size of a living room couch. Something I could put that little ash mound in. But a, a raised bed, and there was a roof. That was it. Just something to sleep in for a couple of nights until I moved on. And so that's what I did. I built these things over the course of that second summer. I'm along my whole route, so I could hunt from Mount Cobb all the way across Music Mountain into a town called Dunmore, which is about six miles away. 
I could hunt that whole area <clears throat> and fish it. And that's what I did. I'd go, you know, so there's certain times you can hunt, certain times you can't. But we'll continue that on part six.